Welcome to another Fact of Fiction Friday. I am the guinea pig, Christopher McKell, the professor, Jason Parsons. Today, we have a fun one. A lot of things going on about this raw food craze. So, are raw foods better than cooked foods? Is that fact or is that fiction? Um, a lot of people ask me questions about nutrition and exercise. I know you've asked me a million things. It's something that irritates people on a regular basis is when I respond to a question such as, are raw foods better than cooked foods? My answer is typically going to be, and will be in this case, well, it depends. So let me explain why it depends. Um, many, many, many years ago, back in the olden days, uh, when man was still just figuring out how to make fire, Neanderthal times, right, caveman, um, we were able to start growing as a population of humans on the planet because we used fire to start to extract more nutrition from our foods, from the animals we caught, from the fruits and vegetables and plant matter that was around us. Man learned that if you cook foods, the chemical process that is cooking, putting it over heat, it changes how much energy, read here, calories, you can get out of your food. So interestingly enough, the chemical process of cooking, whether it's with fire in your, <laughs> on your barbecue, in your oven, baking something, uh, steaming things, microwaving, or even frying things with hot oil that uh, creates a vapor barrier around foods if you're doing it right, all those different means are putting heat energy into the food. And that heat energy chemically modifies the structure of the molecules inside those foods. Doesn't matter if, again, if it's a piece of meat, right? You caught some deer, cutting that piece of meat up, putting it over the fire. Or if you took, in this case, like this right here, a sweet potato that you dug up out of the ground and you heated that up from the raw state, baked it in the oven like a lot of people do at Thanksgiving, it changes it, right? So have you you've had sweet potatoes before? Yes, sir. Right, so baked sweet potatoes, and we'll use that as our starting example, the difference between raw and the baked one, you can feel it in your hand. It's totally different. One is rock hard. A sweet potato on the ground is like a, it's like a rock. You'd think it was if you were digging up yourself. Like, man, hit a rock or something. They're really hard and firm. As are most plant materials, fruits and vegetables, things like that, because the cellular structure of plants is very different than that of animals, right? The cells of animals are, are circular and squishy and soft, but the cell structures of plant material are kind of rectangular and they're very hard. They're made out of fiber, cellulose. You may have heard fiber, eat fruits and vegetables, you get a lot of fiber from that, right, in your diet. Well, the reality is that fiber, that cellulose, is very rigid, very rigid in structure, right? So the structure of cells inside of plant material, in the case of our sweet potato, makes them very firm, very hard, very difficult to break into to get the nutrition out of, right? So a raw food, like this raw sweet potato, it's very hard for us as humans to break it down, digest it, if you will, and get the nutrition that's available inside those very diff tough, tough walls of fiber, right? As we cook it, we use that heating in your oven to chemically alter the cellular structure of that sweet potato. It becomes soft and squishy. And one of the things that people love about kind of overcooking sweet potatoes, you will, it starts to change those starches into sugars. Mm -hmm. They chemically convert them. The sweet potatoes actually become very sweet when they get into their soft cooked form. In this case here, one of Chris's favorite things, I know this from my working for a long time, is sweet potato fries. Mm -hmm. mm, delicious. Right? So when you cut your sweet potato up into those little tiny fry-like pieces, it's still hard and firm and kind of has a not very good taste, kind of bland and bitter, right? Once you bake them, once you fry them, whatever choice method you use, whether it's you cooking yourself or you go out to a restaurant and get them, something very interesting happens. So starches and complex carbohydrates that are in the raw material of the sweet potato convert into sweeter sugars, more simple sugars. Now that's a great thing if your goal is to get a lot of nutrition, all the nutrition available in that uh, sweet potato into your body. And, and, and what that means is get all the calories and squeeze all of them out of it and absorb all those calories. But if your goal, just like Chris's goal, is to lose weight, you don't necessarily want all the maximum calories you can get out of your food. In the case of sweet potato, we actually talked about some of our prior videos. The starches that are inside the raw form when you chemically convert them by heating them up, whether fried or baked, into the cooked sweet potato fries, it changes into sugars, getting all the calories out of it. However, a fun little fact here, if you let that cool off before you eat it, the sugars inside the sweet potato will turn back into what's called, do you remember? A resistant starch. Resistant starches, yes. exactly, right? Resistant starches that started in the raw form got switched into sugars when you cooked them. If you let it cool off, They'll turn back into resistant starches, thereby cutting about half the calories out of your sweet potato fries. That's a big difference for somebody on a calorie restricted diet that's looking to lose weight, like yourself, like some of our viewers. 
Just a simple act of cooling off your sweet potatoes, your cooked rice does the same thing, cooked beans do the same thing, cooked potatoes, other forms like baked potatoes, mashed potatoes, you can let them cool off after cooking and it reduces the amount of available calories because some of those sugars turn back into resistant starches that your, your, your body just can't absorb it. So, so, to be, cool. so to be simple, if you're looking to gain weight or consume more calories. There are some crazy people that want to gain weight. You know, bodybuilders, uh, athletes need a lot of energy. Somebody just wants to put on some muscle. They want to look good for the girls really at the bar. Super skinny people. Super skinny people. <laughs> you want to cook your sweet potatoes and eat it while it's hot. Eat it while it's hot. Right when it comes out, ah, burn your fingers off. If you lose weight, you don't have to eat the raw version. I recommend eating raw sweet potatoes. You can still cook it, but let it cool down like we talked about last week. On the nose, brother. Exactly. exactly right. You're, you hit it on the nose. The important thing here is to, to learn some stuff as we talk about this. I come in here, me, the professor, the brainy nerdy guy, come in here, hopefully explain some concepts that allow you, the viewer, also you, Chris. <laughs> it's already working on you, man, but we want to share this with the world, right? The things I've taught you want to share with the world. These are things you can do yourself anywhere, in a restaurant, at home, at your neighbors, at a family meal when it's Thanksgiving. Hey, leave your sweet potatoes on the plate until the last thing you eat so they've cooled off. You got more benefit, right? Now, how does it work with a lot of people into this whole cauliflower craze, cauliflower rice, mm. cauliflower mashed potatoes. Gotcha. This is the stuff that I use a lot to replace my mashed potatoes and potatoes mm -hmm. and french fries regularly. What do I still get my sweet potato fries in? <laughs> um, how does the cooking process affect cauliflower? If it's different or if it's the same? Or... Good question. So that is a very popular thing. I have a lot of people ask me about riced cauliflower they take it and cook the cauliflower and they make it to a little, it's like almost like fried or uh, white rice down there or we're just using uh, cauliflower is a substitute for other potatoes. So a regular starchy white potato replaced with cauliflower has like one fourth of the calories. A huge difference. Also has one fourth of flavor, so I kind of stay away from myself. But that's me. I'm just picky like this. So, um, good question. Cauliflower, just like all other plant materials, same cellular structure that retains their firm, fibrous structure. That's why raw cauliflower is very crunchy. I know you're a fan of raw cauliflower. Mm -hmm. Also, you eat when you go to the parties and stuff, and nobody else eats it. They eat all the broccoli and carrots and stuff like that. You're like, look at that cauliflower. Seems like I'm the one who eats it. The only one. <laughs> Lucky you, right? Yep. <laughs> so the uh, cooking of cauliflower does chemically change it. It becomes softer. That's how they can make it into rice cauliflower or mashed cauliflower substitutes, things like that. Um, so it does increase the amount of calories available, but what we want to make sure you understand is cauliflower doesn't really have any calories to begin with. It's really low in calorie density. So it's, in that case, pick which one's best for you. If you find it's a great substitute to sub in instead of white potatoes, because that's way less calories there, great option, man. Go with that. Yeah, I keep it simple. I eat it raw for a snack. I cook it if I'm going to substitute some type of uh, carbohydrate type of mm -hmm. thing in my meals. Perfect. Um, and then the other thing we're talking about, a big thing, I mean, everyone, I mean, I had sushi yesterday, last night. This man right here eats sushi probably three times a day. Cut his finger that's cutting that's some true. sushi the other day. Yeah. Um, when it comes to sushi, raw fish, which is a huge, huge industry, yeah. um, how does fish compare with as far as cooking to get more calories and all these different things? So, sushi coming from Japan, being very popular street food there, is now just internationally acclaimed, and it's actually beating up the poor fish population out there. But that's a separate conversation. Sushi is one of my favorite foods. Sashimi, specifically the fish that is included with the rice. Mm -hmm. I typically like just the fish part. I'm not too much on rice. It's kind of boring, but. The fish itself, just like other food stuffs, when you cook it, when you heat it up, it changes it chemically. We're eating it in a raw form of sashimi or nigiri sushi. We have a little piece of fish laying across the top of it, right? Mm -hmm. I love the salmon. That's one of my favorites on sake. That's my Play favorite. Played with John saw the other day. Yeah. Some guy pulled out a five foot tapeworm from his body. Oh, that's awesome. Eating salmon every day. Yeah. Well, you don't have to worry about that in the United States because <laughs> in America, all of our fish is, uh, is very safe because we have it frozen to a certain temperature for a certain amount of time to kill any kind of parasites and stuff inside it. So your sushi, sushi here is safe. Go to some other place, it might be a little more suspect, so you don't have to worry about tapeworms here. So scary stories that is, it's just a scary story, that's it. So back to our salmon Have sushi. you checked? <laughs> <laughs> just in case, nobody wants to pull a five foot tapeworm out of either end, that's not good. So um, with salmon sashimi, the, the, if it's raw right there, right? Once you start cooking it, whether it's like seared, sometimes they do seared salmon, right? Or they'll do a blow torch on it and you know, cut through that. It's processing it. It's chemically changing that salmon and uh, making it so that it's easier for your body to absorb the nutrition, meaning calories, inside that salmon. Again, not good, not bad. If your goal is to get a lot of calories because you're an athlete, because you are, have a super physically active lifestyle, you want to gain weight, you're trying to build bigger muscles, you need more calories, cooked salmon is probably better for you. You're gonna get more nutritional value out of it. 
On the other end of the spectrum, raw salmon requires more work by your body. Another thing we've talked about in the past in one of these videos was the thermic effect of food. With proteins, it's much harder to break them down. In your stomach, all that acid, that's really there to break down proteins. That's what the acid is for, because they're very complex molecules, these, these uh, amino acids inside proteins. So if you're eating raw salmon, it's actually much more work for your body to break it down biochemically to absorb to be used. You get less calories out of it, about 20, 25 to 30% less calories from salmon that's raw versus cooked. So if you're a weight loss goal, sushi's your friend on the raw end of the spectrum. I would go with that. Cool. Um, one of my favorite things that I love to eat for breakfast and lunch and well, dinner too, I guess all the time, are eggs. I love eggs. Mm. It's a big part of my diet. It's one of the first things I recommended you starting putting into your diet to help to switch up increasing proteins, increasing great fats, and decreasing all the extra carbohydrates you're getting from those rice and beans that you love with that Cuban American background. Eating a lot of them too. Right? And so we threw in some eggs into your diet to help you. And in the case of eggs, this is one of my favorite things to talk about when it comes to raw versus cooked. This is one of those examples where cooked eggs, in this case the beautiful fried egg you drew over here for us. I don't know if you noticed, but Chris does all the illustrations because I can't read my own handwriting half the time and I mess up stick figures. So he does the pictures up here, just so you know. <laughs> the cooked egg versus the raw egg, huge difference in the availability of protein. A lot of people eat eggs out there in the, uh, the health and fitness world because there's a lot of protein in them. Would it be egg whites? That's silly, just do it by itself. Eat the whole egg, right? Um, all that protein is not available in its raw state. Interesting enough, you only get about 50% of the available protein in an egg if you eat it raw. So Rocky over there drinking a cup full of raw eggs like that, first of all, that's gross. That's like having a really bad cold meal. <laughs> That's, that's nasty, <laughs> so don't do that. Uh, secondly, you're not getting all the protein out of it. If you want to get all the protein, if you want to get all the calories out of your eggs, you need to cook them, because then you get up to about 90%, almost double the amount of protein availability in a cooked versus a raw egg. Additionally, there's this protein inside of eggs called avidin, and that avidin actually stops your body from absorbing biotin, which is a, a B vitamin inside there. So some people, if they eat a bunch of raw eggs and that's one of their only nutritional sources, which isn't most people, it's, it's not. We usually have general, uh, real spread around diets with all kinds of stuff. Um, that avidin stops you from absorbing vitamins. You actually get a deficiency. When you cook it, avidin goes away. It denatures it, it's no longer bioactive, and you get your biotin that you need. So another positive benefit of cooking eggs. Now, is there a difference between a fried egg and a hard boiled egg? Because hard boiled eggs usually cook a little bit more, you think? A little bit more, it depends, and you can cook hard boiled eggs. Side or exactly, or exactly. Or so on a spectrum, we have raw egg over here, just popping out of the chicken, right? You might want to say thank you. So raw egg, and we have over easy egg, right? We have a, like a poached egg right there, they're pretty close to the same, over medium, over hard, what did you do to the egg that's messed up, why are you doing that? And we have hard boiled eggs over here on that spectrum, and that's how much cooked, right? The difference between those, real soft and liquidy, and it starts to become more and more and more firm, all the way to that hard boiled egg, hence hard boiled egg, just like the opposite of a plant-based food, in this case, these start hard and end up soft, these ones start soft and end up more firm, the cooking process, it's changing the proteins, it's changing what's going on inside the egg, and it's making more bioavailable, right? So you actually get more calories out of a hard boiled egg than you do the raw egg, and all the oil on that spectrum, it increases. So is that good or bad? Again, neither. Based on somebody's goal though, I recommend on a regular basis, and I've done this with you, hard boiled some eggs in advance, those are great snacks to take with you. They're portable, they're already cooked, they're ready to go. They're great protein and fats in there to keep you satisfied for your next meal. But don't eat 10 of them a day because they are pretty calorie dense and you're getting all the calories out of it when you cook it. So I know everybody likes meal prep Sundays. Right? <laughs> like a bunch of hard boiled eggs to have. Yeah. We got a bunch in our house. What's uh, going on with these little guys here? So, We've talked a lot about are raw foods better than cooked foods? And my first thing was, well, that depends. It depends on your goal. It depends on how much you cook it. It depends on how you cook it. It depends on what the thing is. The reality is, raw or cooked, neither is better. They're just different. But something to consider when cooking foods. If you cook them yourself, or if you go to somebody else, you go to a restaurant, some other place, I'll use a steak as an example. Because I love steak, you love steak, right? Mm -hmm. Nice ribeye, mm -hmm. tomahawk ribeye, big bones, yeah, beautiful. The raw end of the spectrum, that steak is really tough for your body to break down. It requires a lot of energy to chew it up and to break it down in your stomach. So the thermic effect of food is high. You get less calories and bioavailability when it's raw. As you start to cook, rare, medium rare, medium, medium well, well done. Shame on you if you cook a nice big ribeye to well done. Shame, don't even want to talk to you. We're not even friends. 
But if you were to cook it that far, if heaven forbid you grilled that thing too long and burnt the outsides, there's black on there. Overcooking things can actually be very bad. Overcooking, way on the end of the spectrum, right? Where you've burnt the outsides of meats or even vegetables, if you're grilling vegetables, things like that. Typically it's with fire that you have this problem, not as much steaming or microwaving or whatever. If you're using the oven to broiler or if you're barbecuing something and you have that direct high, high, high heat contact from flames, you can overcook things to the point where some of that material, whatever it was, plant or animal, can turn into a carcinogen. That means it causes cancer. You've mutated that food by that chemical process of heat so much, it's not even recognizable more, it can have a problem with your body. So we don't want to overcook things. That's, that's really the only kind of bad, right? When, when, you're, <laughs> when you're talking about uh, overcooking, I love me some uh, barbecue chicken wings. Mm. I tend to like a little char on there, that's bad. <laughs> Like is, is there's that, no is absolute that amount or is it like no, totally don't, just, burnt? Don't, don't make them completely black. Don't, don't do that. That's bad. If you have a charcoal or kettle, that's not even chicken wing anymore. What's wrong with you? Right. So a little crunch. I like my chicken wings crunchy too. I don't like them soft. That's gross. So I like to make them a little bit crunchier myself. Just be careful. Don't do too much. We don't want to. Have like, uh, especially if you if you uh, marinate it with barbecue sauce or yeah, something. That, just, that'll get. That's typically off. not char. What you're finding right. there is the sugars in the barbecue sauce are caramelizing. Right? They're, they're changing in color, getting very firm and hard and like a dark brown, right. almost black. That's the sugars changing inside that. That's not the actual chicken wing itself. So that's, that's okay. That's kind of an exception there. Just don't cook your meat to death. First of all, shame on you. That's not how you're supposed to eat meat, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it also could be bad for those carcinogens created. One last thing I also want to add in on that overcooking thing. If you like to fry things like your sweet potato fries. Some people like to bake them. Some people like to fry them. I like to fry them. Um, Whatever oil you use, and I typically recommend using oil that has a high smoke point, right? So it doesn't smoke up your house if you're doing it at home. Um, you only want to use that oil maybe once or twice. Reason being, if you keep reheating, cooling, reheating, cooling in the oil, remember the oil itself is changing chemically as well, not just the foods you're cooking in it when you heat them up. The chemical composition of the oil starts to degrade, and that high heat and back down, back and forth, creates a lot of free radicals, oxidants. You've heard of antioxidants, mm -hmm. things that are inside of fruits and vegetables that are good for you, right? So that you don't have your cells of your body breaking down the aging process is really driven by free radicals slash oxidants. Yeah, that's what we don't want to have. So using oil over and over again, it starts to go rancid. It, it, it's very high in oxidants, free radicals. It can be very bad for you. So overcooking stuff to the point of charred, bad. Don't do that, that's not good. And then don't use fried or frying oil repetitiously get some new oil because it's going to be way better. Can you share with everyone when you say a high smoke rate, high smoke, point? High smoke point for oil, what type of oils? Because I have no So it, I like to use peanut oil. A lot of people think peanut oil is going to taste like peanuts. It doesn't. It has a neutral flavor. It doesn't have any oil. But peanut that's, oil that's is what, fries come from peanut oil. It certainly does. And honestly, if you go to different restaurants, different places, and you're like, man, their fries are made. It's the same potatoes, mm -hmm. right? What are they using differently? It's the oil. Typically, you're going to find the oil different. And they can fry at a higher temperature with a higher smoke point oil. So what that means is that the different grains and nuts and all kinds of different oils that are extracted, olive oil, all these different things, the temperature at which that oil can be raised up to before it starts to create smoke coming off of it, the higher that temperature is, the better it is for frying, right? It, like if you use butter, some people use butter. It has milk solids still in it. Those milk solids will burn off and you'll create smoke at like 200 degrees, not very hot at all, right? And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have peanut oil that's in the many hundreds of degrees before it gets to the smoke point. You don't even need to get that high. If you're cooking, you know, typically at 375, maybe 400 degrees of your oil to fry things in, that's not even close to the smoke point for peanut oil, so you're never going to have it burning off the top and having those oils broken down. So that's, that's what I'd recommend in that nice. So finally, with all that being said, and it comes back down to raw versus cooked, this is uh, Chris's little picture of Goldilocks and the three bears over here. Yeah, we didn't have a yellow marker, so there's no yeah, Goldilocks. I didn't, but I didn't make it too pretty either. It's okay. It's better than I could do, buddy, so I'm not going <laughs> to complain at all. <laughs> So Goldilocks and Three Bears, I use this story regularly for a lot of things, with exercise, with various things, with calories in, and in the case of raw versus cooked, same thing holds true. Just like in that fairy tale, that story, Goldilocks and Three Bears, not too hot, not too cold, not too big, not too small, not too little, not too uh, large, I already said that one, wow, repetitious. <laughs> That's good, <laughs> we got the point. Don't cook it too much, don't necessarily have everything raw. Find what works for you, everybody's different, but start with your goal. What are you trying to accomplish? If you need more calories, you probably want to cook some more. Cook your food a little bit more, right? Don't go as raw as much. Have uh, cooked salmon instead of sashimi. That's a better option for you. Have your cooked sweet potato fries hot as opposed to raw sweet potato that nobody eats anyway, but whatever. <laughs> if your goal is fat loss, if you happen to be something like Chris that's out there trying to lose some weight, you need to have less calories going in your face. 
And some of the things you can do deal with cooking on that case. So you want to err towards the raw side. Have your broccoli raw. Cool down your sweet potatoes over here after you cook them. Have your uh, eggs sunny side up instead of over medium. That little change like that changes. This, this was one quick thing I want to bring up that before we got started, we were talking about it and it snapped in my head when I saw this number here. A cooked egg has 91% more protein, which means it's got more calories because proteins have more calories than say a vegetable, carbohydrate. Yeah, yeah. Well, in this case, the, the, real, the reality is cooking gives you more total calories available. If that's what your goal says, if you're an athlete, you're doing a lot of stuff, you need it for the day because you're going to go out and bust your butt, cook it, have some cooked food. More cooked, right? As opposed to raw. If that's not your needs, if those aren't your goals, towards the raw side, it'll be better for you. All right? It looks like this week we've had our first. This is not a fact, nor is it a fiction. Thank you, Absolutely. Professor, for messing with our heads. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you guys for coming again. If you have any questions, as always, leave them in the comments below. I'm Christopher McKell, the guinea pig. Jason Parsons, a professor, we're signing off.